Welcome to this Summer Sabbath Sunday here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Danny. And I'm Connie. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a joy to welcome you to this special day of worship here at First Presbyterian Church here in Columbus, Georgia. And whether you are a member of this church or our extended family, whatever church you belong to or none at all, whatever city you um, live or dwell in, we are glad 
that the Spirit has bound us together this morning for this time of worship. I would like to invite you to pick up your smartphone and or your phone phone and give someone a call and or a text and give them a greeting and welcome them to worship this morning. A uh, reminder that we will continue to take prayer requests through text format on your smartphones. So you can text your prayer requests to 706-940-2575. That is 706-940-2575. We will weave some of those into our prayers of the people. And even if it doesn't get to that prayer, we will be praying for all of those prayer requests and concerns over the coming week. Um, secondly, I wanted to let you know that our server here at the church um, has been, uh, well, the old one died last Monday, and so we've spent all last week uh, trying to get back up to speed. We're not quite there yet, but we're close uh, which means that we haven't been able to send or receive email all week. Um, there have been other things we've not been able to do and access because of our servers uh, that connect all of our computers uh, and to our operating systems here at the church. Uh, but again, we hope that that will be remedied Monday or Tuesday. But thank you for being patient. If you need to contact us, please contact us directly. You can call us or text us anytime. Um, we are in the midst of a canned food drive, and that is for Columbus State University's food pantry. Uh, it has been running dangerously low over the summer, and so we have decided to help ourselves. So you don't have to be a member of the church, or you can be. Just bring canned goods, um, whatever you would like to donate, and uh, you can bring it by the church anytime. If you come by the side entrance, our covered area, our port de cachet, um, you can leave it right there by the door and we will bring it in. We're trying to fill up several. Uh, we've got a box a receptacle container that we want to fill up and continue to fill up uh, to get our college students through the summer um, who were unexpectedly having to deal with food insecurity issues because of the COVID-19 environment. So please help us keep them healthy and fed. All of you, bring some food to the church this week. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, we concluded our virtual vacation Bible school last Friday. It was a whole lot of fun, and I wanted to show you what just the a uh, home screen looked like for those who joined us for virtual vacation Bible school. So you see the fun icons that are all over the page and the way that this worked is that um, on your computer screen, you would click on any one of those people that you see around that camp scene. Uh, the, the theme was Compassion Camp. And so there, it's a camp, uh, fire camp environment. But each time you click on each individual person, it would take you to a different uh, video or sets of videos. Some were lessons, some were music, some were yoga. Um, it, it was just a whole lot of fun. Our own families did Bible videos and submitted those uh, to dramatize Bible stories. Um, that handsome devil there in the suit with the, the huge fish, which is a little smaller than I usually catch. Um, but I did a greeting and some other things. So anyway, I just wanted you to know how fun this was. And it really was a, an effective way. Um, if we couldn't be together, it, it really went really well. So I want to thank Beth Bridges, Gabby Parker, and Vicki Deeth for their work in this VBS uh, virtual first time uh, uh, that we tried something like this and it was better than okay. It was great. So again, congratulations to them and everybody that participated. Thank you all. So we have gathered to celebrate this journey. Let us worship God. Please join me in our unison call to worship. This morning we're using Psalm 86 verses 11 and 12. Psalm 86 verses 11 and 12. You'll see this on your screen. Please join me. 
Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. We come to this time of confession as we have all fallen short of who God created us to be. We know that we are sinful. We know we make decisions that separate us from God, from one another, even from ourselves. But it is not God's desire that we be weighed down with the burden of our own sin, guilt, and shame but rather that we would be freed, freed to inherit the new life that Christ offers us when we open our hearts, when we confess and repent. So with open hearts and minds, let us come before his throne of grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession printed on your screen. Abba, Father, you fashioned us in your creation glory. You crafted us in your image and called us good. Forgive us when we turn away from your glory in order to glorify ourselves. Forgive us as we have allowed fear to divide us. In the name of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and fill us anew with faith, hope, justice, and compassion. And now let us continue in silent personal confession. Amen. Friends, the good news this morning is better than good. It is great. It is overwhelming and sometimes even difficult for us to comprehend. And that news is that while we were yet sinners, God sent Christ to do what we could not, to bridge that chasm that we had created in our own sinful and rebellious nature. God loved us so much that he sent Christ to be our Savior There was only one who is worthy to judge and condemn us. It is Christ himself. And he gave himself on the cross for all of us and was raised on Easter morning for all of us, having overcome the powers of sin and death. 
Therefore, in the name of the risen Christ, I declare that our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Good morning, everybody. Boys and girls, y'all come on down and join me up front today. Yeah, welcome. So this week at First Presbyterian Church, the week behind us, we had VBS, which usually stands for Vacation Bible School, but this year it was our virtual Bible school. So I want to start by thanking all of the parents and the grandparents and all the church family members who helped pull everything together and make the week such a great success. So we were at Compassion Camp all week, meaning we were learning about compassion. We were learning about taking care of each other and ourselves and lots of different ways to do that. And we started every day by hearing ways that people in the Bible did that. We started with a father and two sons and learned that everyone is welcome at the table. And then we heard about some friends who were really brave and lowered their friend who was on a mat, lowered him through a hole in the roof of a house where Jesus was so that Jesus could heal him. And then we learned that the greatest commandment that God gave is really pretty simple. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And we were reminded that it's okay to make sure that our needs are taken care of just as much as others. And then we met Ruth and Naomi and Orpah, and we learned that it's important to be present with each other in their hurt. And then finally, we learned about God's gift of jubilee, the gift of rest and fresh starts. And every day we ended Compassion Camp with a compassion prayer. So I'm going to invite you, the children and grown-ups, to join me in today's compassion prayer. Now for our prayer, we put one hand on our head because we learned that compassion starts in your brain. And then the other hand goes over your heart because it's often in our hearts where we feel compassion. So I invite you to close your eyes and repeat after me as we pray. Loving God, fill us with your compassion as we care for others and ourselves. Help us to be brave and work for justice for all in your creation. And all of God's children say, amen. And now please pray with me. Holy Spirit, teach us and form us more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear our first lesson from Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared with someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, Did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. 
let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect all the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat in my barn. And then skipping down to verse 36. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age." The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out all of his kingdom, all co- collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone who has ears listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, beautiful pre-recorded choir. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody we are not open. Nobody is here. Just Connie and I are here, but we are grateful to have the witness uh, of those who have shared their gifts in former services so that we can continue to worship as safely uh, as, as we can. So thank you again to them. Our second reading is taken from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the book in Rome. We are in chapter 8, love chapter 8 of Romans. I know many of you do too. We are in verses 12 through 25. Listen for the word of the Lord, Romans 8, 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we know that 2020 has been a struggle and a challenge. We know that there have been so many layers to the onion of what we have to deal with, what we get to deal with, and what we must deal with, that so far in this year, we have been overwhelmed and overrun. And friends, I'm sorry to hit you with one more significant issue we're all going to have to deal with. It has to do with hope. Paul talks about this. We'll get to it in a little bit. But I'll, I'll just read you the press announcement. After nearly four decades, Christian Alfonso is saying goodbye to Salem. The actress who's been playing Hope on Days of Our Lives since 1983 will not return to set when the NBC soap returns, <coughs> excuse me, production in September. Take a deep breath, friends. In through the nose, out through the mouth, turn to someone near you, give each other a hug, we're gonna be okay. Alfonso has played Hope on the soap opera since 1983. I think I was a freshman in high school. With the exception of a few breaks from the show, she left in 1987 but returned for a few months in 1990 for a storyline that concluded with the entire town believing that she, Hope, had died. But she returned again. In 1994, as Gina, a woman who has, everybody say it with me, every soap character gets it at one time or another, amnesia, who looked like Hope. 
Of course, Gina was actually Hope, but was brainwashed by the villainous Stefano de Mira, whom she later killed. The actress herself says, Days of Our Lives has been a vital part of both my personal and professional journey. The actress said in a statement last Monday, I am forever grateful to NBC and the late Betty Corday, who took a chance on me many years ago and changed my life. I've built some lifelong friends with my extraordinarily talented castmates. Days has been one of the hardest working crews in all of television, many of whom have become part of my extended family. I feel blessed and honored to have been invited into people's homes over three decades. Interesting. Now, Days of Our Lives has always been around in my life as my mother and sister watched it when I was a kid. When we would go see my grandmother in New Orleans, she would make us watch it and we were trapped and had no choice. And interestingly enough, even in graduate school, we would all gather to watch and kind of make fun of like you might a a modern uh, Hallmark movie uh, about, you know, don't go in there, he's cheating on you. That's not Gina, it's hope she has amnesia. Now, before I completely lose my man card in talking about soap operas, I grilled yesterday several different meats. So I'm hoping that kind of balances out. But they're losing hope in fictional Salem, Illinois. Hope is retiring. What Paul talks to us about today in the midst of this Roman passage is just the opposite to make sure that our hope is not lost and our hope doesn't retire. Let's take a look in Romans. Love Romans, one of my favorite books, just a great book to study. Paul is, well, and a lot of good things going on here. But one of the things that draws us to this time and place is this passage in 18, 12, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Now, some of what Paul is talking about is end of times, eschatological second coming, when Jesus comes back to redeem fallen creation, when Christ comes again and everything is as it was created to be originally and meant to be for eternity. But friends, we are not in that time yet. We know it. We are in that in-between time when Christ came the first time for his 33-ish years of ministry on this earth and ascended. And then we are in also this time of waiting till Christ comes again, the second time to redeem all of creation and us human beings as a part of it. We are in that in-between time. Christ came, Christ will come again, and we are right smack dab in the middle. And at times, this is a hard place to be. Our sufferings are great. We have so much that we have to deal with, so much that is going on inside each one of us personally, inside of our marriages, our friendships, our families, our churches, our organizations, our cities, our states, our country, our nation. There's so much that we would put into the suffering category as well, I hope, as so much that we would put into the joy, the growth, and the moving forward on this journey category. Now, when Paul is talking about hope, which he does all the way through this, It's not a blind hope that is more like optimism. Several, many sermons ago, we talked about hope and optimism. Optimism is more of kind of a secular, I just, I'm thinking positively, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, or it's going to go away, or I'm not going to face this, I'm not going to face this. Optimism 
is to some degree shallow. Although what's good about it is that it helps you with a positive uh, mental attitude. And that is crucial, I believe, to negotiating so many challenges in life. But it isn't optimism that drives us or that Paul talks about here. It is hope. One of the things that Christianity has been criticized for is just this empty, positive thinking, some God will take care of everything someday mentality. If we go back to Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto and influenced many uh, systems of government, of communism, um, one of his criticisms of the Christian faith, he talks about when he says, Religion with these fantasies, meaning that all we're doing is thinking positively that something bigger than ourselves is going to magically take care of everything and we will never suffer. These kinds of fantasies drugs those who suffer and perpetuates their plight. Drugs those who suffer and perpetuates their plight so that often heard criticism that religion is opiate for the masses, meaning that we manipulate with our harmful theology, that we just, we don't rise up, we don't do anything, we sit back passively and wait for God the magician to wave God's magic wand and the world will be made right. And even for those who suffer, it perpetuates their plight, Mark says. It makes it worse. It doesn't give them any positivity. It doesn't give them what Marx would say is hope. As a matter of fact, it takes and makes it worse. Now, for Marx not to be right, for Christianity not to be this kind of flight a fancy or a pie in the sky. We just throw everything up to God and we will skip into the sunset, fluffy bunny kind of theology. What Marx didn't know was the suffering of Christ in addition to what he may have understood about the resurrection. And Paul isn't one to gloss over difficulty or suffering. Emil Brunner, who's a Swiss theologian, shaped a lot of our Reformed uh, Protestant theology, said that what oxygen is for the lungs, such hope is for the meaning of life. What oxygen is for the lungs, such hope is for the meaning of life. Without Christian hope, life is not worth living. So what makes it that thick and rich? What makes it different than what Marx says? What makes it different from just positive thinking and optimism? Well, one of the things is the suffering that Paul alludes to. Suffering and persistence. Suffering and glory come together through Christ. His glory came through his suffering, and we experience glory in our lives not without some degree of suffering. Those things go together. And anybody who tells you that the Christian journey is just one, again, that is all fluffy bunnies and sunsets and skipping off into the sunset sunset with my buddy Jesus is doing harm because it downplays the reality of suffering in our lives, and it is real. You know it, and I know it. But Paul doesn't at all explain this away or give a shallow theology that Marx could criticize in that same way. Paul knew well from his own sufferings of his times of tortured, being beaten, being stoned, shipwrecked, almost dying several times in a variety of ways, imprisoned, tried, falsely. Paul doesn't at all say, come on, let's hop on this Jesus bandwagon and all will be made well. Quite the opposite. Here, 
the hope that we experience as Christians is not just positive thinking. The hope that we experience as Christians is in what Paul calls experiencing the first fruits. Paul talks about it in our passage today. In the process of creation groaning and the labor pains of creation not yet being redeemed in verse 23. And those not only, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean? What are those first fruits? A very simple way to understand that is to say the first fruits of the Spirit are what God has already done for us. The first fruits of the Spirit is what are the promises that God has kept. The things we have experienced that we somewhat base our faith and our lives as Christians on. We were created by God originally as a part of humanity, as a part of the larger creation of this world. All of the covenants and promises that God made with prophets, male and female, with judges, with kings and queens, all the way through the Old Testament, all of the promises made true through the whole sacrificial piece of the Jewish Old Testament. And then finally, promises kept through Christ. Friends, if God was truly a vindictive God of wrath, even a God of justice, that means we would get what we deserve and God would never have sent Christ. How do we know God loves us? So many ways. But one is that God sent Christ. And because God sent Christ to be our Savior, who endured the cross, as we talked about in our assurance of pardon this morning, was raised on Easter, we can come home to God when we turn and repent, when we confess our sins, when we seek God with all that we are. Therein lies our hope. It is not a hope that says, if I pray to God, all of my troubles will disappear. It's not a frivolous hope that says, if I go to church enough, if I volunteer at the homeless shelter enough, if I read scripture enough, if I go to enough Bible studies and breakfasts and so on and so forth, that everything difficult will disappear. We are closer to Marx than we are Christ. But it is in this acknowledgement that we lean towards suffering. We don't run away. Sometimes we try to skirt and we can get through some of it that way. But there are times that all we can do is pray for God's presence, guidance, protection, and to help us hit something head on. And we need to continue to remember that distinction of hope. It is not light and fluffy. It is not just a frivolous word. Or Marx is right. Then we are just empty heaving thoughts of positivity into an, a godless ozone space and environment but it's so different. And that's what Paul is making sure that you don't lose your hope because we can already look at those first fruits and know that God is faithful. We lose our hope when we know that we haven't been redeemed or we don't know that we have been redeemed. We lose our hope when we aren't connected to God, to Christ through the Holy Spirit in our life. We can lose our hope when the power of darkness becomes stronger than the power of light, we lose our hope when we try to fill ourselves with those things, those distractions in our life that keep us from letting our souls be filled with that which God has given us. Never lose your hope. It is, as Bruner said, like the oxygen that we breathe, 
Christ-rooted hope is who we are. Again, because of the first fruits that we've experienced, and if you in your life have not experienced those first fruits, and maybe you can't yet proclaim all of those things that I listed as God's promises kept, well, then you come on. Let's work on this together. And we will walk on that journey. That's a part of a first fruit also, being given the gift of one another to travel this journey with our communities of faith and the opportunity to learn and to grow through the Holy Spirit, through one another as a church family. So come on, come on. Do not lose your hope. And do not choose and do not make and prove Mark's correct, that we are just empty and shallow with our Christian understanding on this level. Hope is rooted in our first fruits. Secondly, well, before we get that, let me finish one story in hope. It's a story a Lutheran pastor named Reuben Youngdahl tells. It's about a young man while visiting in Dublin, Ireland, one summer. Youngdahl noticed this young man had on his desk in his study a plaque with two words on it. The words were, but God, B-U-T space G-O-D. Pastor was so impressed by this plaque that he had one made up for himself and put it on his desk in his church. Visitors to his office would ask him, what do you mean by those two words, but God? He explained that in his hour of deepest need, he had learned to say, but God will help. In a moment of utter despair, he could say, but God, dot, 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 will give me hope. In a moment of loneliness, he could say, but God, dot, 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 is with me. When he felt insignificant and unwanted, it would help to repeat, but God, dot, 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 loves me. That always turned the scale from despair to hope, from defeat to victory, from sin to salvation. But God, a reminder that God is always with us, proving those first fruits and second fruits and third fruits. So waiting patiently, we are so bad. We wait patiently for the redemption of all of this mess that we see. We live in this hope that we've just talked about, rooted in the risen Christ with the acknowledgement that suffering is a part of this glory and that we must wait patiently. So what do we do in that meantime? We don't, do, we don't wait, none of us. I know I don't. Henry Nouwen, a wonderful Catholic priest, once said, if we do not wait patiently in expectations for God's coming in glory, we start wandering around, going from one little sensation to another. Our lives get stuffed with newspaper items, television stories, and gossip then our minds lose the discipline of discerning between what leads us closer to God and what doesn't, and our hearts lose their spiritual sensitivity. Waiting patiently is not a passive thing that we do here. Waiting patiently doesn't mean, ah, oh, tick, 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 tick. The clock. Come on, God, come on, God. God's time will drive us crazy most of the time. So what are we to do? Well, we, do we just wait in hope? No, we wait patiently in hope. What does that mean? It means that being passive is being actively working towards God's kingdom. Patience is not the same thing as acquiescence. Patience is this sense that we are not satisfied with the present, but lives towards a future promised by God. So being patient means we are actively working on kingdom living now. Last week was all about uh, sowing seeds. This week in Matthew about pulling weeds from those seeds as they grow. Patience is active. 
Many years ago, a pastor in Glasgow, Scotland, named George McLeod, chanced to look up at the stained glass windows over the chancel of his sanctuary. The phrase, glory to God in the highest, was carved in the glass. As he looked, he noticed that a pane of glass was broken and missing. The pane on which the letter E in the word highest was carved. Suddenly he found himself seeing the words that were now there. Glory to God in the high space street, S-T. High Street was oddly enough an avenue nearby for which those in mental, physical, and spiritual anguish often resided. It struck McLeod that the only way to glorify God is to glorify Him in High Street. The only way to truly glorify God is to glorify Him where we live, work, and play. So when we say we are patiently waiting on a hope rooted in Christ, it means that we are actively waiting. Patience takes many forms. And here Paul is telling us to be active in bringing about kingdom living. Be active and working towards others as, they, as we seek to share with them who God is, who the risen Christ is, and the joy of having that in their life should they choose. So friends, go forward today and no, do not lose hope. Hope has not retired. Hope is not dead. We live as creatures of hope and we breathe it like oxygen. And it is rooted in the risen Christ. It is rooted in the knowledge that suffering is a part of this journey that will lead to what Paul says is the glory that we can't even imagine. So hang on and hang tight. And know that being patient means that we are being called to active ministry, to spread the love and light of Jesus Christ in this world. Alleluia. Amen. And now please join me in saying what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray together. Abba, Father, God who knows us in our weakness and loves us nonetheless, you have made us, and by your grace we live. You have redeemed us through faith in Christ, and your Spirit inhabits us. So we are bold in prayer, certain that you not only hear, but that you respond to our pleas for help. As we in the church bear witness to the life, the teaching, the suffering, the death and resurrection of Jesus, we trust that you are with us in our trials whether large or small. We pray that we will heed your Spirit's urgings to grow in faith and in witness in this particular season. We pray for those who are suffering in their bodies, in their minds, in their spirits, for those who are in the midst of major life transitions. Grant them restoration, wholeness, Help them to trust in you and to lean into hope. We pray for families, for children, grandchildren, grandparents, parents. Grant understanding and perseverance as we strive to love and support each other in new ways. Bring learning and growth. 
Lord, we thank you for the children and their families who participated in last week's Vacation Bible School. May those lessons continue to nurture the souls of saints young and old. Lord, we pray for teachers and school administrators. Give them a fresh vision and enthusiasm for those who they serve. Blow your creative spirit through our educators. Grant students and parents a spirit of collaboration and appreciation as they learn and grow in new ways. We pray for your strength for those who serve us, for our military, our medical people, firefighters, police, social workers, those who provide us with food and the goods we need for daily life. And we pray for your church, that you will transform her so that she brings a strong, hope-filled, joyous witness to you. We pray today for those who grieve losses of loved ones, both recently and in the past. Lord, you have made us for community, and we are formed by those who have touched our lives, and we thank you for their influence upon us. We miss them, and we gratefully, again, entrust them to your good care. This Sabbath day, we rest in your goodness and your love for us, so that we may continue in your mission of grace. Strengthen and refine us according to your will. We make these and every prayer in the name of our strong Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now it's a time in our service where we serve our generous God by bringing generous offerings of ourselves, of our time, of our talents.
Let's pray together. Great God, we thank you for these gifts that have been given, and we would ask that you would use them as the sower distributed his seeds around, bless this offering, that it may grow your hope, it may grow your patience, that it may grow shoots of love and grace, joy, compassion, and justice through this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now, friends, as you go forward, know that you are being called as people of hope. Don't prove Karl Marx correct by living shallow, empty, vapid Christianity. But to know that your hope is rooted in the risen Christ, that our life contains both suffering and glory through Christ as we experience God now and in the future. And be patient, but it is an act of patience that means that we live now to continue to build this kingdom living. So now, as you go forward, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.